Uh, a big shout out, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the idea with Relax Muscle uh, was that we were a techno billy duo from Doncaster. Um, and uh, that, that's the person who did the group with me, Jason Buckle, he was, he's from Doncaster. My name was Darren Spooner. Uh, and I was supposed to be a former club singer going through a messy divorce with a drinking problem. <laughs> Obviously, fictional. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we did one EP, the heavy EP, and nobody knew any of the wiser. But then we did, a, we did a concert at Bethnal Green Working Men's Club in May 2003. And even though I had a skeleton suit on and heavy makeup and spoke through a voice altering effects unit our cover was blown uh, and we did do an album called a heavy night with relaxed muscle um, probably in the bargain bin here and uh, it came out in 2003 uh, and so to give you an e uh, kind of a bit more of a window into darren's world um, I'm going to read this. This, this originally was in uh, the Christmas 2003 edition of, of Time Out, you know, the Listings magazine. And um, I don't know, I think I got the wrong... The brief was something like, what's your dream for the future or something like that. But this is what they got. <laughs> Which is not really what was required, I don't think. But anyway, uh, this is called Darren's Dream. So you've got to imagine, this isn't me doing this, this is Darren, okay? <laughs> Don't mix the two up. Right, this is Darren's dream. Right. It was night time. I'm not going to do it in an accent now. It was night time and I was outside on a country road. There were hundreds of toads trying to cross the road to get to their mating pond. But they were moving too slowly and they were getting squashed by passing juggernauts. I wanted to pick them up and carry them across the road to the pond. But I didn't have anything to put them in and I don't like touching things that are slimy. Suddenly, I was standing on some cellar steps with a bad stomach ache. There was an awful taste in my mouth. I realized that I had swallowed the toads in order to transport them. I began heaving and eventually sicked up a large toad covered in thick mucus, <laughs> then another, then another. After a while, a door opened at the top of the cellar steps and someone shouted down my name. Barry White was due on stage in ten minutes and I hadn't ironed his shirt yet. I ran up the stairs and I was in the kitchen area of the Park and Arbuthorne Working Men's Club. An ironing board was set up near the cooker with Barry's shirt on it, but I couldn't plug the iron in because it had a Europe European plug on it and the PowerPoint was English. Jane Seymour walked into the room, wearing the same outfit as in Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. That's her on the, on the left there, yeah. She put her arms around my shoulders and tried to kiss me. I said I had to finish the shirt. How do you think I got my hair so straight, she said. She took the plug of the iron and put it in her mouth. Then she bent over the ironing board and began ironing the shirt. I took her from behind as she was doing this and the iron let out a cloud of steam. Soon it was like a sauna. Her skin was smooth and covered in beads of sweat. I felt that I was about to come. I closed my eyes in order to savour the moment. In my ear I heard the words, is everybody in? Is everybody in? I opened my eyes and I was sat round a campfire with some Red Indians. Jim Morrison was dancing <laughs> and singing with a bottle of Newcastle Brown in his hand, which he kept swigging from. He had a long beard and was very overweight. He was wearing a flowery shirt and tracksuit bottoms. The smoke from the fire was burning my eyes. I looked down and saw I still had a hard on. None of the Indians had noticed. <laughs> They were arguing about whether to allow a monster truck rally that was scheduled to take place on their land the next day to go ahead. Jim began to sing, I believe I can fly. <laughs> the Indians took no notice. I was appalled because he was getting all the words wrong. A shot rang out. Jim fell onto the fire and was immediately engulfed in flames. He burnt blue like when you put rum on a Christmas pudding. I guess that's all the alcohol, I thought. Charles Bronson approached the campfire 
his rifle still smoking. He was dressed like in Chato's Land, which is my favourite film. He offered me some chips. They're cooked in dog fat, he said. I took one to be polite. The toad taste came back into my mouth and I had to spit. It landed on one of Bronson's moccasins. The Indians went crazy and dragged me to my feet. Bronson was laughing. They dragged me over to a large wooden pole stuck in the ground. Eva Herzegova was already tied to it, wearing her bra and pants, like in those adverts from a few years ago. They tied me up so that my body was against hers, face to face. Save me, save me, she whispered. Her breath was hot on my cheek. I wanted to do it to her, but I was tied so tight I couldn't move. I knew that in a few seconds we were going to be burned to the stake. All I could do was rub myself against her a bit. As I rubbed, she kept whispering, save me, save me. And the pole began to grow out of the ground, going higher and higher and higher. The flames will never reach us here, she said, and we started kissing. Suddenly, there was a the sound of a gunshot and her body went limp. Bronson was shooting from below. The same shot that had killed her had broken the ropes holding me. I moved around to the other side of the pole and began shinning up it. At the top of the pole was a trap door. I pushed it open and climbed through. I found myself in a Shaolin temple, just like the one at the end of Enter the Dragon. Bruce Lee was sitting on the floor crying. <laughs> I asked him what was wrong. He told me that his manager had signed a sponsorship deal with Gap and now he had to wear cargo pants whenever he fought. Plus, he was signed up to do a tour of British holiday camps during the summer, demonstrating his martial arts skills. I saw that he was indeed wearing cargo pants, although they were black instead of the usual khaki colour. I told him from a distance no one would be able to tell. This seemed to enrage him and he jumped up into a fighting pose. I said I didn't want to fight because he's one of my heroes, but he wouldn't back off. He kept doing flying kicks to my face, but I wouldn't fight back. My nose started bleeding. And when I looked down, there was a Yorkshire Terrier <laughs> licking up the pool of blood that had collected at my feet. I kicked at it to shoot it away, and it sunk its teeth into my foot. It didn't really hurt, just like little pins sticking in me, but it was irritating. <laughs> I tried to shake the dog off, but he wouldn't let go. I kicked him against the wall, but he still wouldn't let go. I realised that I was going to have to kick the dog to death to get it off my foot. I didn't want to do this because I'm an animal lover, so I started to cry. Then I heard Bruce Lee laughing at me, and I lost my temper. I gave him a roundhouse kick to the head. He fell to the floor, and when he got up, the Yorkshire Terrier was attached to his face. It seemed to be eating his cheek. He screamed and jumped through one of those paper screens that they always have in Kung Fu films. I looked at my watch and I saw it was half past 11. I suddenly remembered that we were supposed to be playing a concert and that we were due on stage at 11.15. I was late. I pushed open the temple doors and I could hear music coming from up a staircase. I ran up the stairs and I was under the stage. The stage was see-through and I could see the rest of the band playing without me. I banged on the stage but they couldn't hear me because they always play so bloody loud. It was like that bit where the kid's under the ice of the omen. They finished the song and I managed to attract Jason's attention. He opened the trap door and then I was on stage. Then he started laughing. I looked down and I still had a hard on and no trousers. <laughs> then I woke up. <laughs> <laughs>